Welcome to Walk in the Spirit, an expository teaching of God's Word with Pastor Brian Griffin. Walk in the Spirit is an outreach ministry of Pocatello Baptist Church. It is our prayer and desire that with the help of this message, we will all learn to walk in the Spirit. Romans chapter 9, <laughs> verses 24 through 33. Follow on me as I read again, if you would, please. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, as he has said also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which is not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also cried concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of the Sabbath had left us seed, we had been as Sodom and made unto like Gomorrah. And what shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel which followed after the law of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness? Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone, as it is written." Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever shall believe on him shall not be ashamed. Let's pray. Father, Lord God, we come before you this morning, Lord, and we ask right now, Lord, that your spirit would come upon this place, Lord, upon our hearts, Lord, Father, and Lord, upon my words, Lord. May your spirit speak, Lord, Father, remove your servant, and let your word teach now, Lord, Father. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for all you do for us and how wonderful to you as you are. Truly, we are a people, not who were your people, Lord, but now are a peculiar people, Lord. And we just thank you that you saw fit to come for the likes of us. In your son Jesus' name we now pray. Amen. So I remember as a kid, one of the things that I absolutely hated the moment the most, and maybe each one of you had an experience similar to this, or maybe you hadn't, I'm not sure. But one of the moments I hated the most as a child was I remember when we'd be on the playground or perhaps we'd be in gym class at school, that it came time to choose teams. Do you remember that moment? It was time to choose teams. And, and I hated that moment because always, it always would make somebody feel a little bit unwanted, wouldn't it? And in particular, because obviously the way I walk, as a child, I've walked this way my whole life. It obviously looked like I had a disadvantage, in particular, when it came to sports. And to a certain extent, I possibly did. So I kind of knew that when it came time to choose teams, I was going to be the last guy standing there, right? I mean, that kid who had asthma was going to be chosen before Brian was chosen, now, I kind of got used to the idea, and I, got, I honestly started to not get offended by it. I kind of got excited about it, I won't lie, because I also knew that I did have some ability, at least a little bit more than the kid with asthma, right? I'm teasing. The kids with asthma are just perfectly fine, all right? Some of them became band members, which I never understood. They blow through an instrument all those hours, but they can't run forever. I don't get that, but that's okay. Okay? That's a whole nother story, Right? Anyway, but you know, I, I, I hated that moment. Maybe you've had that experience too. And uh, it, one of the reasons why it bothered me so much is when I knew when I went to a new school or perhaps to a new group of friends, or maybe I was doing tryouts for baseball or something like that, that I would be that last child, that last child chosen. Which in all honesty, no matter what your parents tell you, makes you feel kind of like, what's the matter with you? There must be something wrong with me, Right? And so we'd kind of feel a little bit less than the rest of the children to a certain extent. But as my teens would oftentimes discover, what they saw as a disadvantage, really in reality, turned out to be quite an advantage for me. For example, in baseball, because I drag my feet when I run and most of the baseball fields are made of dirt, if the wind happened to be blowing at all, I looked like pig pen and they couldn't see. <laughs> right? I mean, that's an advantage. No, you know, there's more talent than just that. I get that. But this is why if you've ever played a game with me, in particular a sport or something outside, you may have noticed if I was chosen as a captain, I would start by picking those who I would, the world would consider or most would consider the less desired players. I would always start with them and pick them first. Because no matter what, I love ending up on a team that despite the outcome, win or lose, we're going to have fun and enjoy each other's company. 
I don't want to be on a team where it's all about, I've got to be the best. Because I know I'm not the best. If I was the best, I wouldn't be standing in the pulpit right now. I'd be pitching for the Cleveland Indians. Right? So I know I'm not the best, and I'm okay with that. This is the same heart, though, that honestly is one of the things I love about my Lord, because I see this same heart in my Lord Jesus, a heart that has always been like this, displayed in our text this morning. A heart that says, I don't need the best. I don't need the best. I want you. The best according to the world anyway. Look at our passage again now. Let's just re- begin by reading verses 23 through 24 through 27 again together. Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, as he, said, as he saith also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall ye be, they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also cried concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. A remnant shall be saved. So, now, in calling the Jews... We recognize that the Lord Jesus, in calling the Jews, that the God Almighty in choosing the Jews as his people, chose a people that history would tell us would be a people that the world would not desire even to this day. Right? I mean, let's be honest. Nowhere, were they ever, nowhere that the Jews have ever had a major settlement or a major influence are they somewhere that people, except for maybe Hollywood, where they would say they were accepted and people liked them. Right? I mean, they've always been kind of a despised people. So he did that in the beginning. When making the promise even to, for the heirs of Abraham, the Lord said this to the people that would be his heirs in Genesis chapter 15. You don't have to turn there. But Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, he said this. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall be afflicted for 100 years. Now we know, and particularly he's talking about Egypt at that point, but notice there he says they're going to be strangers in the land. When Abram called, was called of God, Abram didn't ha- have a country, a nation, a people. It was he and his nephew Lot and their families that took off. That was it. They were not necessarily what we would consider the powerhouses of the day. A great community, this great strong house, this, this, just, just this, you know, people that we go, oh, those are the ones I want on my team. They were strangers. What I really want to talk to you about this morning, what I want to focus on is this second group here in in verse 24 in particular, where it says there in this second group, or excuse me, in the second group of verse 25, so those who are my people, he says this of us. I want to focus on this. He says, those, I will call them my people, were which not my people, and her beloved, which is not beloved. In this second group, the apostle lists here, he calls the Gentiles. He's speaking about the Gentiles, those who are not of the house of Israel, but they shall be the people of God. But before we explore this any deeper, I want you to notice whom, whom he called, whom he hath called, not only for the Jews, meaning the Jews are still called, but now a new group added to them who were despised even of the Jews. This group that he called second time were despised even of the Jews. Do you understand that? Now, we think, what? How could everybody be despised? Well, here's the thought. Let's explore this a little more. But before we do, I want to turn to Hosea where we get this prophecy from. Hosea chapter 2, verses 19 through 23. Hosea chapter 2, verses 19 through 23. It's an amazing thought here. And I want to read this because I hope this speaks to your heart the same way it did mine. Remember, bearing in mind that we who are not a people are now going to be called a people Hosea chapter 2, verses 19 through 23, the prophet writing says this, And I will be told, then the Lord speaking to the prophet, excuse me, And I will be told thee unto me forever. Yea, I will be told thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even be told thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord, and it shall come to pass in that day. I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth, and the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. And I will show her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy, and I will say to them which are not my people, thou art my people, and they shall say, 
thou art my God. One of the reasons why I love to turn to this passage, we know in particular he is speaking of us, the church, the Gentiles, that he was going to call us. But one of the reasons why I love this passage is how he starts out speaking about those of us who are not a people being called. Notice what he says there, and I will betroth thee unto me forever. Now, I remember when Shauna and I got engaged, and I'll, you know, if you've never heard the story of how I proposed, you can ask Shauna sometime, I did a good job. All right, that's all I'm going to say. I even have pictures to prove it. All right. But the Lord here says that he's going to betroth us. We are engaged to him. We are his love. We're the one that he has set aside his life and his heart for. Do you see that in there? That's what he's speaking about when he says, I will betroth you unto me. Right? And I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercy. So he already recognizes that he's going to have to be long-suffering with us, patient with us, and merciful towards us as his bride, as those that he would call. He already recognizes what we're going to have to be and how he's going to have to behave towards us, even in this moment. I love that the Lord said this in the book of Hosea in particular, though. I don't know how many of you guys have ever had the opportunity or taken the time to read the book of Hosea, and understand what the book of Hosea is all about. Hosea was a prophet of the Lord, whom the Lord came to Hosea and said, Hosea, I want you to take Gomer as your bride. Now, if you don't know nothing about Gomer, I'm going to give you the short list here. Gomer was a woman of ill repute. She was not somebody that people would go, that's the Marian kind. All right? Gomer was not like that. And the Lord came to Hosea and said, I want you to marry her. And you'll love her, and your heart will be after her. And she will reject you. And she did many times throughout that story. She'll run off with other men, which she did in that story several times. And you will go have to search after her. And even in that story, we see where at one point, Hosea has to actually literally go buy his wife back. Now, if that doesn't sound like the story of Jesus Christ, I don't know what does. Because Jesus Christ came to us, his people, and he says to us, he says, you know what, I know you're filthy, nasty, and the world doesn't like you. I know you're unacceptable in the sight of most men. And here's what I want. I want to marry you. Why? Why? There's nothing redeeming in me. As a matter of fact, Lord, there's a good chance that if you marry me, I'm probably going to run away from you. My heart's going to go yonder from you come sometimes. That's okay. I'm still going to come after you. Matter of fact, I'm going to come so hard after you that eventually, if I have to, I will buy you back, which we know he did on the cross. Amen. So what we got here is a story, a real love story. And this is interesting that the Apostle Paul takes us to this point to speak about this new group. To Hosea, those people who were not a people, now his people, and then he says this about them, that they are what? Beloved. Beloved. Turn back to our text now, if you would, for a moment here. Look at that, what he says there in verse 26, or verse 25. He says, and he saith unto Hosea, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which is not Beloved, her beloved that is not beloved. When I think about the Lord calling us beloved who were not beloved, I can't help but to think of some amazing things and examples of the fact of what he was saying here. Just looking on the surface, we are now beloved. Who were, we are now loved who were once unlovable. The point is driven home to us when we look not only at the, disi at the disciples, but, uh, uh, but everything else. Let's look in particular at the disciples for a second. I mean, let's think about Paul the Apostle, for example. Christ loved him. And what did he do? He was out there trying to destroy the people who loved Christ. But he loved him. How about Peter, right? We pick on Peter all the time. Peter, this gruff and tough, gruff-looking fisherman, right? Probably spoke like a sailor, okay? Maybe not the sailors we know nowadays, but, you know, whatever they were back then, okay? Thou foul creature, I'm not sure. Right. But, you know, Peter, this rough guy, this guy who honestly constantly was kind of sticking his mouth in his foot. We talk about that all the time. Right. Now, one of the things I have to say, I love Peter because at least Peter would say something. Right. But, you know, we look at Peter. But how about this one in particular? And this is the one I want to look at this morning, a, 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 a disciple, an apostle that we don't look at very often. How about Matthew? 
Have you ever stopped to consider the Lord called because he loved him, Matthew? Now, if there's a, there's a man in the Bible that we should go, wow, why would the Lord call him? We should look at Matthew. I know you're sitting there thinking, why Matthew? What, what's interesting about Matthew, right? Well, turn to me to Matthew chapter 9. Turn to me to Matthew chapter 9. Let's just took, take a look at this together. Right? Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 11. Let's just read this together. This is when the Lord calls Matthew. Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 11. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus said it, Meet in the house. Behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto the disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But Jesus heard that. I'm going to go on because I can't forget this part. But Jesus heard that and said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth, and I will have mercy and and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. But sinners to repentance. Notice he said and ate with the publicans. It was a feast. Luke tells us that this feast was organized in particular by Matthew. And we know, and unless you're confused by reading this, that Matthew was a publican. Because so amazing was the idea of Jesus calling a publican to be his disciple that Matthew, in writing this, he, in writing his list of those who would be called the disciples, even listed that important note. If you'll notice there, and just flip over a page or two pages, whatever, to Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, as Matthew lists now for us the disciples of Christ, I want you to notice what he does in this list here. He, main, he names surnames and stuff like that, but there's only one person that he says what they did for a living. And then he mentions Judas Iscariot, which he tells us what he was going to do, right? But look at this list now, verses 1 through 4 of Matthew chapter 10. And when he called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the 12 apostles were these. The first Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus, and Lebius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. You notice that Matthew takes the time to point out in identifying himself as who he was. He was Matthew the publican. Now, Lest you think that if you would have lived in that time, you would have thought differently of Matthew because, you know, he must have been a good guy for the Lord to call him. Maybe you don't know what a publican is. A publican, a publican, publican. I keep thinking I'm saying Republican, but I'm saying publican, so I want to make sure. But a publican is a tax collector. And worse than that, in all honesty, they weren't just a tax collector from Rome. They were a Jew. What the Romans did is they would take Jewish citizens and they would appoint them. They didn't have the choice, by the way. They would appoint them as publicans. You're going to collect the taxes for Rome. If you would, they were likened in the day of Jesus Christ the same way the taskmasters were likened in in, in, in Egypt. Those of the Jews who basically had to hold the rest of the Jews accountable. And that's that's what he was. So hated were the publicans. He points out that he is a tax collector and he had to collect the taxes. And by the way, it would be a very difficult position to find yourself if you were a Jewish man because the Romans didn't pay them for doing so. How they got paid was by the extra above and beyond Rome required what they collected. So in other words, for him and his family to survive, he had to take extra from the people, more than Rome even required. Now we understand hating tax collectors, and if you happen to work for the IRS, I apologize, we still love you. But the truth of the matter is we understand that difficult position. Our tax collectors don't get paid because by what they they collect, technically speaking, I guess you can go in the whole logical sense of the whole thing. We pay it and the government pays them, so yes, they do. Okay, but nonetheless, all right, their wage is not dependent upon how much they collect. So they're a little bit better off nowadays than they were then. As a matter of fact, so despised Republicans that Jesus used them to describe his desire of how we should worship him. Did you know that? You're going, what? Yeah. 
Turn with me to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. And a parable we're all familiar with. We've talked about it before. Luke chapter 18. Let's just pick it up at, at verse 9 of Luke chapter 18. It's the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. It says this, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even as this publican. It's like a swear word. At, that I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess, and the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, but he that humbles himself shall be exalted. So Christ even recognized how significant it was that he would call a publican. He understood how despised, how hated these people were. I love the Lord said about, I love that the Lord called a publican. In other words, he called the absolute dreg of society, somebody who nobody else in the world would have wanted or desired, he called to be his disciple. I believe he does the same today because honestly, I believe I was maybe not a publican in the sense that I collected taxes, but I was a publican at one point in my life. I was a man whom nobody would have desired. Heck, I didn't even like myself. And the Lord called me. So I love the instruction we see there. So we see how Jesus came to make those people who were previously unlovable, those people who were sick, those people who needed a physician, those who nobody cared about. We see how the Lord came and took them, made them his heart's desire, and made of them a people, or if you would, a team. But it's not unlike our Lord to understand this from the beginning. I told you that, right? That he, these are the type of people he should want. I'm not going to, in the interest, interest of time, make you turn there, but if we were to turn back to Matthew, we would see the Lord's genealogy. I don't know if you've ever paid attention to the Lord's genealogy or not, but I just want to read it to you real quick here. From Matthew chapter 1, verses 2 through 6, the Lord's genealogy goes like this. And Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judas and his brethren, and Judas begot Perez of Sarah, and Sarah of Tamar. Okay, I want to pause there for a second. You remember the story of Tamar? Judah's daughter-in-law, who basically had to trick him into sleeping with her so she could be impregnated and actually have some heirs. Right? Now, we know Judah was wrong because he didn't give his last son to her to, be his, to, 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 to take as his bride. But she went and played the harlot to fool him. Interesting. That's in our Lord's genealogy, by the way. And listed in our Lord's genealogy. Notice this is one of the women that's listed. There's three other. And Perez got Ersom, and Ersom begot Aram, and Aram begot Amadab, and Amadab got, begot Nisan, and Nisan begot Solomon, and Solomon begot Boaz of Rahab. Remember Rahab? What do we call her? Rahab the harlot. Right? Bo Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, was born of a harlot. That's in our Lord's genealogy. And Boaz begot Obed of Ruth. We know the whole book of Ruth, right? Ruth, a Gentile, who came and said to, her, to, to Naomi, her, her, her mother-in-law, your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. And she married Boaz. And it's a love story. If you've never read the book of Ruth, make sure you read it. And Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David and the king. And David the king begot Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah, or in other words, Bathsheba. Right? Now, was she a woman who we would say was a virtuous woman? No. Now, we know David had fault in that as well, right? But look at that. These characters are listed in our Lord's genealogy. He understood those who were undesirable those who nobody would love. Which really brings us to that amazing love that God has for those who are not a people, now, who, who now are his people. As a matter of fact, I think the Lord is instructed to us even in whom he first revealed himself to be the Messiah. 
If you would, he shows us how beloved those dregs of society are. If you would, those of us sitting in this room. Because of whom he even revealed himself to first. Turn with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. John chapter 4 is an interesting story, and I'm going to pause as we go through this story. We're going to read the whole thing together, guys, but I, I just love this story. This is the first person the Lord decided to reveal himself, literally out of his own lips, to say that he was the Messiah. There may have been people who had suspicions, but this is the first person that he acknowledged the fact that he was too. John chapter 4. If you have titles at the top of your chapters, you probably see that it says, The Woman at the Well, right? John chapter 4, picking it up now at verse 3, and we're going to read through verse 42, so just hold on. We'll pause in the middle there and take a look at a couple other things. He said, he left Judea and departed into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, I can't say that word, I'm sorry, Sychar, near the, the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Verse 6, now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus at the well, and it was about the sixth hour. And there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith unto her, Give me drink. And Jesus saith unto her, Give me drink. Then saith this woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. So we're going to pause here first. First, we see a couple of amazing facts in this story. First, we can recognize that this woman was a woman who was not a woman respected even amongst the dregs of life, according to the Jews, the Samaritans. Um, why? Because she comes to draw her water at a time when no one else would be there. Typically speaking, women would go out to the well together and draw together for two full purpose. One, to help each other out. Two, to keep each other safe. All right? But she goes out there alone. She goes at a time when nobody else goes. She's obviously not even respected amongst the Samaritans. Right? And we understand why as we go down this story. But the second thing I want you to see here is this woman is surprised that Jesus would speak to her on two accounts. First, she is a Samaritan. The Jews hated the Samaritans. They were honestly, I mean, right next to publicans, right? They were horrible people. They did not like them at all. So hated were they that oftentimes if somebody had to tra travel through that region, if a Jew had to travel through that region, a particular priest or somebody of the house of Levi, they would walk around. They would go the long way around to avoid having to go into that region. So hated were the Samaritans. They'd walk around to avoid it. And not only this, but she's not only just a Samaritan, but she's a woman. Right? She's a woman. And we know back then that women in particular were not revered the way that the Lord instructs us to revere him in his word. So here she was, not only a Gentile Samaritan woman, but she was also a woman. Even Jesus acknowledged how, how the Jews thought about the Samaritans. If you remember, and I'm not going to turn us there in the interest of time, but if you remember it in the parable of the Good Samaritan, how surprised they were that a Samaritan man would be compassionate when the Levite priest had walked by, a good man of Israel had walked by, let that man lay, lay there and die, didn't care. But the Samaritan took, bound up his wounds, poured, poured oil on them, paid for him to stay at the inn, and would pay, pay anything extra when he got back. That's why it was so shocking, that parable was to them, because they were like, why would a Samaritan do that? Samaritans are nothing but Gentile dogs. They're horrible people. But then he goes on in our story now, picking it up, continuing on at verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, to thee Give me drink, thou would have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, how is, how, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob? Don't you just kind of want Jesus to say, uh-huh, right there? I kind of do, but anyway. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? And Jesus said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water which I shall give him shall be unto him. Excuse me. Shall be, I just lost my place, shall, shall be in him, that's important, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. 
Jesus makes an offer here that this woman would be, would be so appealing to this woman that she would have access to a never-ending supply of water, a well. As you look at the translation to hear the Greek, it's really speaking about an artisan well, one that bubbles refreshing itself all the time, right? It would have been a prized possession if you had an artisan well back then. Now, we understand what he's really speaking about, don't we? And notice that he, she missed the point where he said, this well will be in you, Right? Now, here's the point, though. It, it, what, she's really, what, what, what we're really running into here is this. As he says, he shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. This water that's refreshing itself. She would have been really excited about that idea. Why? Well, because, first of all, she would have had something that no other woman in that community had. Access to very clean and fresh water. Something that nobody else had access to. She probably could have returned herself to a place of prominence in her community by simply knowing where this well was at and taking advantage of it. But as we continue on, we know what the Lord is really speaking about. In verse 15, he says, The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And Jesus said unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. I want to pause here for a second. There's something very instructive here, here in this passage right now, in this verse right now to us, is when, the Je when Jesus comes and calls you, be honest. He knows you. Right? I mean, he's not getting a prize. He's not coming after you because you're a prize and you're the greatest possession in the world. He's coming after you because he, you're his beloved. All right? Notice he's honest. He says, go call your husband. And she's like, I don't have a husband. She's honest. I don't have a husband. And he says, thou hast well said. And he goes on, yeah, I have no husband. For thou hast five husbands. And he whom, whom, whom thou hast now is not thy husband. In that saidest thou truly. And the woman said unto him, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Right? You just told me everything about myself. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and ye say that the, in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe in me. The hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye worship, ye know not. What we know we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the woman saith unto him, I know that the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. He just revealed himself as the Messiah to who? To a woman of ill repute. A drag of society, somebody who was hated by even her own people. She was despised. And I, I, I find it very interesting that, it, that she had five husbands. Why? Because, in other words, she was constantly looking for love, wasn't she? She was constantly looking for somebody who was going to love her for more than just her flesh. Somebody who was going to love her for her. Somebody who was going to care for her because of who she was, not because of what she could offer to them. She was constantly looking for that. That's why she had five husbands, and that's why the man that she was staying with now was not her husband. Because she was trying to find a man who would be that for her. And she comes to the ultimate. And this ultimate says, I am he. I'm that one that wants to love you that way. I'm the one who cares for you. You are my beloved, if you would. I'm giving you something that you've never had the opportunity to have before, and that is to know that you're all right. Doesn't matter what the world thinks of you. It doesn't matter what society thinks of you. In my eyes, you're beautiful. You're wonderful. You're everything I desire. I love that. I love that. And we know, as the story goes on, that she goes back in and tells the men, and the men in the city come out. Um, and then and it says that, that uh, and, and when he comes into that point, just jump down to verse 36 with me, if you would. All right. When they come back, the disciples even marvel that he would speak to her. But when she gets back with the men, this is what it says in verse 36. Jump into verse 36. The Lord instructing us says this, speaking to his disciples. And he, and he that reapeth receiveth the wages and gathers fruit unto eternal life, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. 
All right? I want you to notice there that both, both those who sow and those who reap, there's two different parties, aren't there? Get to rejoice together. And then he goes on, he says something very instructive, instructive to, him, to us. When he says, goes on, he says, basically, look up, behold, the, the harvest is nigh, right? But then I want you to see one of the most beautiful verses, in, in my opinion, in all the Bible. Jump down to verse 40. It said, so when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them and abode there two days. When the Samaritans came and they recognized who he was, they didn't want him to leave. And it says in verse 41, and more believed because of his own word. And they said unto the woman, now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. I love that verse. You know why I love that verse? It's because we're his bride, right? We're the woman at the well. We share the gospel, we share the word, but you know what matters? is when they finally hear Jesus himself speak to them. And when Jesus himself speaks to them, what will happen? They will believe on him, not because of our word, but because of who he is. So, when they looked up, when the disciples would have looked up, what would they have seen? A bunch of dregs, a bunch of Gentile dogs. So did you notice something that never happened in that story, though? And this is important for us to understand. There's something that never happened in that story. It never says that Jesus was given a drink of water. Did you notice that? You can read through that story as much as you want. You can try to infer where it may, may have happened, but you will never read that it says Jesus had or was given a drink of water. Now, why is that so important to us to understand? And I believe that the Spirit left that out on purpose, because here's the point. The offer of the living water is not because we give something back. He offered it before she gave him a drink. We don't know that she ever gave him a drink, and yet she received it. And yet she received it. So for the first one that Jesus picked to know from his own mouth that he was the Messiah was the last one that the rest of the world would have chosen. Jesus picks for his team the undesirables. He picks those who normally stand last on the field. Jesus picks those whom the world looks at and says, I don't want them on my team. Those are the ones Jesus picks. Now, unfortunately, sometimes in that story of the, uh, of the Pharisee and the publican, sometimes the people of God slip into the Pharisaical idea. And we stand there and we go, not them, Lord. Right? Well, I tell you, the Lord brings in, in other dregs of society, even according to our own eyes, and you know why he does that? Because what good is smooth sandpaper? None at all. The Lord brings sometimes those who we would even call undesirable in our own eyes into the church so that we can be corrected and we can be smoothed out and Lord willing at the same time help them as well. And Lord willing at the same time help them as well. In fact, the Lord calling the dregs of society would have caused, would have made the Jews and those who would think themselves self-righteous to stumble. Because they thought that you had to do something different to earn it. And that's where he goes to in our text now. Turn back to our text. Recognizing the Lord has called us his people who were not a people and called us beloved who were unlovable. Those of us who in all honesty most of the world looks at and says, nah. Those he calls. And by the way, I'm not saying anybody here is not good looking, handsome, or athletic. All right? Because I, I think I embody all three of those. All right? But, uh, but the truth of the matter is this, guys. That's not what matters in life. That's not what the Lord looks at. And that's going to be very instructive to us as we start to think about what he does next. All right? Read verses 28 through 38, 33 with me now. He says, For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the short work will the Lord make upon the earth. You understand the work that is happening on this earth in the Lord's eyes are short. And Isaiah said before, Except the Lord of the Sabbath had left us the seed, we had been as Sodom and had been made like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then? The Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, 
but as it were, by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall be, not be ashamed. What did they not seek? They sought him not by faith, and because they didn't seek him by faith, they could not have righteousness. Do you understand that? I want to make that point clear. You cannot have righteousness. You are not righteous if you don't seek the Lord Jesus by faith alone. Not of works of the flesh. Not of works of the flesh. Sounds like a team of misfits he's putting together now, doesn't it? Let's take a look now at, at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's talk more about this, this, this idea of how he puts us together. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's read verses 21 through 31 together. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 21 through, 30, or 21 through 31. The apostle writing says, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For if the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you say, you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mightier. And the base things of the world, and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring not these things, uh, th th these things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him ye are in Christ Jesus of God, who has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according, to the, to, according as it is written, he that glorieth, glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Look at that list. Can you imagine this being your lineup, getting ready to put these people on the field? Right? Pick up a verse 27. Cho and he says in verse 27, chosen the foolish things of the world. Right? Now batting the fools. Right? And then he goes on past that point. He's chosen the weak things of the world. Verse 28, and the base things of the world. And the things which are despised. Does that sound like a winning team to you? Does that sound like a team that we would choose to put together? But that's what the Lord put together. That's the team the Lord brought together, and he brought them together. Why? Because they believed by faith. They understood they could not, we cannot, we understand that we cannot and do not have enough works, good works, and never could do enough good works to prove our worth to God. We understand that we're the base things, the despised things, the weak things, the, the things that are foolish. We understand that. And we accept that. And we go, Lord, accept us by our faith in you. Nothing else, Lord. It would be a stumbling block, and it's still a stumbling block to this day. You want to know what the biggest stumbling block to most people coming to the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is? The pure faith, the true faith, the Christian faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the faith of the Bible. You want to know what the most difficult part about that is for them? It's because they go, wait, what do I have to do? Believe. No, what else do I have to do? Believe. But what, what do I have to do to prove myself? Believe. What do I have to do to remain there? Believe. See, they want us to give them a list, don't they? This is what you have to do. Once you're saved, once you place your faith in there, now if you just don't ever swear, you don't ever drink, you don't ever look at people weird, you don't ever lust, you don't ever, then you're saved. Right? That's what they want. They want a list. We don't have a list. There isn't a list. I don't want a list. Because then that just tells me I'm a failure again, doesn't it? He doesn't give us a list. Now, don't get me wrong. The Spirit of God residing in you will help you get over those things. Right? The Spirit of God living in you and living through you will help you get over those things. But if you try to do it under your own power, you'll fail. Right? And then you'll have to stand in that line and have an L on your forehead at the end of the game. Right? Because you thought you could do it yourself. It's not you. It's Him. It's not you, it's him. Why is it such a stumbling block? Because they want a list. They want to know why, 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 why would God love me? 
I've got to have some sort of intrinsic value in me, don't I? The only value we have is that Jesus died for us. Do you understand that? Jesus sees something in us. I don't know what. I look at myself in the mirror and I go, I don't understand why me, Lord. Right? What have I ever done that you should love me? Right? Matter of fact, the night the Lord decided he was going to show me how much he loved me, I was cursing him. I was cursing him. Because just like the woman at the well, all it requires of us is faith. Believing and receiving the living water. Which is why our text says in verse 33, 30 through 33, and, just, and then I, why I'm flipping back there to read this to you, go ahead and flip over to Ephesians chapter 2. This is why our text closes this thought like this. Wherefore, because they sought it by faith, but as, but, but as it were by the works of the law, they thought, 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 excuse me, try that again in English. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. See, it is not about being a Jew or a Gentile. It's not about our works. It's not about who you were, what family you were born into, or anything like that. Faith in Jesus Christ is it. Do you believe? And understand that he is a rock of offense to those who will not believe. Why? Because it's too simple. Every major world religion... Every religion, aside from pure Christianity, and unfortunately it's starting to creep into some of the churches, tell you you have to do something. It is never about what we do. It's about what's been done for us. That's what we're going to celebrate this morning in communion, is what has been done for us, not what we do. But I want to close with this thought for you, speaking of the team that the Lord had put together. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22 says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at the times ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants and the promises, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus ye who sometimes were afar off and made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, the, even the law, the commandments contained in the ordinances, for to make it to, to make excuse me, for to make in himself of twain one man, so making peace. That and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enemy thereby, and came and preached peace to you who were afar off, and to them who were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, and whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also build it together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. My... Uh, I remember when uh, I was younger and I played baseball, we had this uh, young man, and uh, Sean was his name, and uh, I, praised, I, I loved this young man, although he and I kind of butted heads because we both had a disability, and so we always wanted to be the cooler one in the room, right? But Sean was born with his knees in his pockets. He didn't have a, a femur, right? Well, and if he did have a femur, I don't know actually the whole physiology of it, but if it was, it was very short because his knees were in his pocket. Okay, that much I do know, all right? And, uh, and, and I, Sean Cox was his name. I love Sean. And if, 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 if you ever run to Sean, tell him I love him, all right? He won't believe you because I wasn't the same man back then I am now, right? But Sean Cox had his knees in his pockets. And I remember Sean came out for baseball. Now, if there was anybody who run, could run slower than me, it was Sean, right? I and mean, we both would go as hard as we could, and it was, I mean, it was close, Right? And he probably even beat me a couple times, okay? Because he got pretty good, right? But uh, I remember when Sean was on the baseball team and opposite of me, I remember joking around with the guys in the dugout about what the heck can Sean do on the baseball field, right? Because, I mean, I'm cooler than Sean, right? Okay? And you know what was amazing? He'd suited up as a catcher. 
And I got to tell you, he was an amazing catcher. Why? Because you know how most catchers, and I'm not going to get down there because I won't get back up, but most catchers have to squat really low and their knees are up on their chin, right? He just went, bloop. And he was ready, right? In other words, here's the point. His team thought he might have been a disadvantage, but he actually ended up being a great advantage because he was already ready. See, just like with Christ and us in our lives, Sometimes the world looks at us and sometimes we even look at each other in church and we think we're, that that person's a disadvantage. But I want you to tell you right now, that person is of the greatest advantage if we will let them be who Christ has designed them to be in our lives. So don't get upset because you're not as good as someone else. Rather understand that God wants the misfits. Because it's like puzzle pieces, isn't it? And isn't that what he says there? He will build fitly framed together. I'm not a puzzler. I don't do puzzles, right? I honestly, well, I should do puzzles because maybe it teach me more patience. I don't have enough patience for puzzles, right? I figure a big enough hammer or a strong enough hand, I can get that piece to fit, right? Knife, whatever you got to do, all right? But here's the cool thing about a puzzle, right? Is it, it starts out and it looks horrible, doesn't it? I mean, the box looks pretty, which is why most of my puzzles end back up in the box till the next yard sale. But once you, get a, once you get a puzzle done, and you see how with all those little cracks and creases and the weird little shapes and everything like that, how it all came together to make a beautiful picture. Right? I have one hanging in my office that Teresa Mahaffey did for us in honor of her father. Right? When you see it all come together and you see the picture that it's supposed to be. Then you go, wow, that's amazing. And that is what the Lord is doing with his church. He's taking all sorts of funky shaped puzzle pieces, right? Not one of us is out of shape, right? I'm not even out of shape. Round is a shape. I learned that in, in kindergarten, right? None of us are out of shape, but he takes all these funky pieces and he puts us all together and he makes a beautiful picture. He makes a beautiful picture. And he is fielding the best team for his work that could be assembled. Our job is simply to play the game for him. To be a part of it. Let him work through us. Let him be it. Let him coach us to victory. Thank you for studying God's Word with us on Walk in the Spirit. To hear more of this or other portions of Scripture, please visit www.pocatellobaptistchurch.com or you can write us at 190 West Chapel Road, Pocatello, Idaho, 83201. If you live in or are visiting Southeast Idaho, we would like to have you join us here at Pocatello Baptist Church for any of our services. Our service times begin with Sunday school at 9 a.m., Sunday worship at 10 a.m., and Sunday evening evening study at 5 p.m. We have a midweek study and prayer service for both adults and youth on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Child care is available for all of our services. For more information or directions, please call us at 208-237-4915. Until next time, God bless you as you walk in the Spirit.